If you like our show, you should check out Business Casual from Morning Brew. Business Casual dives into the unexpected business story behind everything. How do workers benefit from the great resignation? Will TikTok change the music industry forever? What's behind the wild real estate market? Journalist Nora Alley and comedian Scott Rogowski bring you conversations with creators, thinkers and innovators who can tell you what it all means and why you should care. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Regulation is needed for crypto payments to to enter the mainstream. And so this is a tipping point for regulators, the U.S. government really trying to get out in front of this to restore confidence in the market, to be able to provide the regulation that incumbents need to be able to really drive investment. Hey, gang, it's Tuesday, May 24th. Grace, David, and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by MParticle. I'm Marcus, and today I'm joined by two people we have with us. Both on the payments and commerce team, we have one of our research analysts. It's Grace Broadbent. Hi, Marcus. It's great to be here. Hello. Thanks for hanging out. We're also joined by David Morris, who is one of our principal analysts. Great to be here, Marcus. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks for asking. Very good indeed. Uh, today's fact... What is the origin of the dollar sign? It's that dollar symbol, that S with the line through it or with like a little bit on top and on the bottom or sometimes two lines through it. Where'd that come from? Well, let's start with when the dollar was established after the US Constitution was ratified. Congress passed the Mint Act in 1792, which established the coinage system of the US and the dollar as the principal unit of currency. But where did the dollar symbol come from? Well, it comes from a handwritten PS, which is an abbreviation for peso. In old Spanish-American books, people took the P and placed it on the S. So if you take the P, you place it on the S. Then uh, eventually they stopped writing the top part of the P, but keeping the stem that cuts through the S. So the dollar symbol first occurs in the 1770s in manuscript documents of English Americans who had business dealings with Spanish Americans. That's where it comes from. Fascinating, actually, truly. Always fascinating to be here, Marcus. Thanks, David. Sometimes I'm like, what the hell am I doing up front with all this nonsense? (laughs) So I appreciate you saying that. Because most people listening are like, for crying out loud, Marcus, start the episode. But thank you, David. Anyway, today's real topic is crypto payments. So folks, we're talking crypto and uh, crypto payments more specifically today. Uh, we talked about them, gosh, I think it was a year ago now, Cryptocurrency 101, when we talked about what cryptocurrency is, how it's being used, kind of the basics of crypto. So if you want to listen to that one, go back and check that out. Cryptocurrency 101, uh, we talked about that with, with Dan and also Victor, who are on your broader finance team. But today we're talking more specifically about crypto payments. And we want to start the conversation talking about crypto and the crypto market in general, because if you read the headlines, it looks like things aren't going so well. Bitcoin's market cap is down 38% year to date. Cryptocurrency exchange platforms, FTX trading is down 25%. Binance is down 42%. And Coinbase is down an incredible 73% year to date. Uh, So David, I'll start with you. Why have cryptocurrency valuations seemingly imploded? Yeah, no, it's it's frightening out there. I mean, there's a fear in the market for sure from an investor point of view. I mean, you can see crypto historically as being inherently volatile. And from a, an investor perspective, it's uh, very speculative, frankly. So volatility is something that should be expected. But I think you're seeing a broader reset within the fintech space. You know, the valuations, these company valuations that you're mentioning, the stock prices, Uh, are being set across the fintech landscape. So, you know, that's uh, one lever that explains the situation, but it's about the assets themselves. You know, I think what is most troubling in the near term is that you have stable coins, which are supposedly those coins that are going to be used as a stable medium of exchange. Maybe maybe we can talk about that a little later. Mm -hmm. They're the ones where there's been some some fissures. You know, TerraUSD, Tether are both showing that they're not very stable after all. And that has to do with respect to Terra. You know, you've got 
algorithms that are in financial engineering behind being able to, to tether that to an asset. And tether, it's really just a matter, um, and this goes back prior to this implosion of people really just not being clear about what is backing that asset. And so there's a lot of fallout right now. So I want to jump uh, a little bit ahead to uh, in the conversation because we uh, we're going to talk about what that does to, could mean for crypto ownership in terms of these valuations going way down and, and maybe they'll go way back up again. But I want to jump ahead because you mentioned stable coins, and so Grace, you just recently put out a report: U.S. cryptocurrency payments, and in there you explain the different what they call asset classes of cryptocurrency, and there's three that. You you lay out here. Do you want to explain to us uh, what they are? Yeah, of course. Um, so there's three different types of asset classes. As you said, there's traditional cryptocurrencies, stable coins, and then there's central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. Mm-hmm. And all three of these asset classes apply to payments really differently. So just to start, traditional cryptos is what we think of when we think of cryptocurrency. Think Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the meme coins. And they really allow crypto owners to translate their holdings into a medium of exchange. But as we've already talked about, cryptos are very volatile as investments and people sometimes want to hold on to their assets so the price can go up and down, which can create uncertainty about spending the crypto. Mm -hmm. And so that's where stable coins come in. Stable coins were created specifically for payments to solve crypto's inherent volatility problem. Popular examples include USDC and Tether. So the general idea is that a traditional stable coin will be pegged to the value of an underlying asset and will be backed by assets, which should make it stable to make it a great option for payments. Yeah. So in theory, what you're looking at here is you've got a coin that's, uh, say, tethered to the value of a dollar. So in theory, it doesn't get any more stable than that. It's actually its value is pegged to the world's leading currency. Right. Is that right. is that fair, Grace? Yes. Yeah. And so, but w- what we're seeing right now is a problem with a lack of regulation, which has led to the recent turmoil, undercutting the assets, really key benefit of stability. Things aren't backed as they are saying they should or are backed or not like properly backed by assets. Okay. So then just to finish up with the three asset classes, CBDCs is the last one and they take stable coins just one step further. Um, the gist here is that they are distributed by a central bank, which gives them the coins the same legitimacy and position within the banking system as other forms of money. They're still very early in development and are not widely available yet. For example, like the US does not have a CBDC. China was the first major market to launch one and has launched extensive pilots within the past year, but it's still very much in the development stage. But the idea is that it would bring together kind of the best attributes of digital currencies and fiat currencies. Okay. So we'll talk about regulation in a second. But just go over those again. Traditional crypto, stable coins, and central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. So they're the three. Grace, really quickly, could you give me uh, an advantage and a disadvantage of each to provide a bit more context? So the advantages of traditional cryptos are they have real-time speed and low cost, but the disadvantages is that it's extremely volatile. Okay. For stable coins, they should bring in that stability, but there is currently the lack of regulation, which is messing up with this key advantage. Yeah. The fact is that it's been shown here that stable coins, uh, I think we should call them not so stable coins. Yeah. You've got uh, a situation where some of these coins are, are losing all their value, and that's because they're not as strongly tied to a firm asset as people think. That's really the most straightforward way of saying okay. it. And that's a problem. It's a problem when people don't know exactly what kinds of assets are really backing this coin. And that's what's happening here. Yeah. A terribly ironic name and stable coins, not so stable. It kind of is like social media sometimes feels not so social. Uh, I think, Grace, the, the CBDC, central bank digital currencies, one advantage and one uh, disadvantage. The main advantage is that it provides legitimacy within the banking and payment system. But the disadvantage is it's just not fully developed or available yet. Okay. So circling back for a second to, to the valuations, first of all, will they beca- these crypto valuations going way, way down and have obviously in the past gone way, way up, will they become less volatile over time and, and how soon? 
I think volatility is, is at least for the near term here to stay. You're seeing a uh, market shakeout. And, you know, this is not going to be the last news story about a stable coin that, that implodes. And I, I think that this is definitely going to slow down the adoption of crypto ownership. We don't see it declining this year, but it's definitely going to be more conservative. We estimate a 19% growth in adoption this year. And you're looking at uh, the underlying rationale here is, I mean, a fear and loss of trust in an asset. But the flip side is that this is going to um, put the need for regulation into overdrive. Mm -hmm. Regulation has been needed. Regulation is needed for crypto payments to, to enter the mainstream. And so... This is a tipping point for regulators, the U.S. government really trying to get out in front of this to restore confidence in the market, to be able to provide the regulation that incumbents need to be able to really drive investment. Mm -hmm. That's a very good thing. It's just something that is going to be around the corner and not right now. So let's talk about regulation. So just to summarize, though, you said so cryptocurrency valuation volatility in terms of what that means for crypto ownership, you think it's going to uh, decelerate ownership in the short term, but won't stop it completely. Is that was that fair to say? Yeah, I think there'll be some deceleration in the short term, but long term, we're still very, very positive uh, about adoption. This isn't going okay. anywhere. Got it. So Janet Yellen. Grace, you noted, who, she's the US uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, she gave a speech on cryptocurrencies last month at the American University. Grace, you wrote a piece about this. What were some of your takeaways from what she had to say and some of the most important points to note when it comes to crypto regulation at this point? Yeah, so Secretary Yellen's speech was in response to President Biden's executive order he signed back in March calling on fe federal agencies to help build a regulatory framework for cryptos. She kind of started the action. And in Yellen's speech, she really called for what she's calling tech neutral regulation. She pushed heavily for stablecoin regulation, which we noted we desperately need. She also touched upon CBDCs, stating they can offer efficiency, but also warning that they're still years away. And just last week, the Senator Cynthia Loomis spoke that she plans to release crypto regulation this week. A formal bill should be introduced very soon. And so there's a lot of movement right now towards specifically stablecoin regulation. Stablecoin's recent implosion has really kind of sped along this need to regulate very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no way we'll get out of uh, 2022 without having some regulation passed to be able to kind of rein things in and get people on the same page. Okay. So how does this all affect adoption? I mean, we touched on it a second ago in terms of it slowing it down. Cryptocurrency owners, 34 million we estimate this year, 34 million this year, that's about 13% uh, of the population. Uh, next year, it'll be about 14% of the population. We don't forecast any further out than that. Nazmul Islam, who worked on these forecasts for us, said that that's because of the volatility. It's just too hard to predict any further than next year. But 13% of people in the States will be cryptocurrency owners today, this year, uh, and 14% will be next year. That's uh, 37 million next year. But how could regulation, I mean, this is before the regulation, we put these numbers out now, regulation could change that. How might regulation change that? Will it go down? Will it go up? Definitely uh, go up subsequent to regulation because it provides the roadmap that's needed. But And I, I think it's worth noting, you know, Grace and I really look at this from a payments perspective. And so if you're looking at crypto ownership versus crypto payments, you're looking at a way to be able to enable these millions and millions and millions of growing holders as payers, you know. So that's ultimately where we get into some of the use cases that we see being, you know, drivers of growth growing forward with respect to crypto payments. And by that, you know, I mean, being able to use a digital wallet to pay with crypto or to be able to use a credit card in which you can either earn rewards with crypto or transfer crypto into a fiat currency, mm -hmm. you know, or B2B cross border, uh, you know, it's, it's exploding there. Remittances also exploding there. And um, these are different use cases because those first two are consumer driven and at retail, You've got cross-border B2B, which is entirely commercial, and you've got remittances, which is ultimately about migrant workers being able to utilize remittances more cheaply and more efficiently, mm -hmm. and crypto is perfect for it. Yeah. For me, a big part of this is the messaging, at least personally, the messaging has been bad. But then 
after reading your report, Grace, you have a piece in there which talks about cryptocurrencies, you say, have the potential to transform payments. Blockchain, the technology that enables cryptos, lets businesses and consumers transact at real-time speeds, lower costs, and with greater security, among other benefits. Some of the benefits you laid out a bit earlier when we were talking about the different asset classes. After reading that, I was like, oh, cryptos could be really helpful. <laughs> but I feel like, do you feel like the messaging has, and the volatility in the markets as well, has, has put a lot of people off the idea of crypto? Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a stigma attached with crypto right now that has come from both market volatility and also an association with some illegal transactions that crypto has been associated with. And I think, as we said, it's definitely messaging and it's also regulation. I think once we have regulation in place, consumers and businesses will be feel a lot more comfortable using cryptos. And we yeah, expect to be able to see their benefits come to fruition once kind of more regulation is in place and the market matures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, some people, the whether regulation is good or bad really depends on who you ask in the business world. <laughs> um, but ultimately, one thing that regulation can do is help provide alignment on what people expect and understand. It can provide transparency, especially for consumers, about what they're getting into and what's behind a particular stablecoin asset and that kind of thing. And so in those ways, I think regulation will be incredibly uh, important in being able to restore trust and also to reduce the volatility that these stablecoins should not be exhibiting in the first place Mm -hmm. if they're to be used as intended. Yeah, absolutely. Regulation could absolutely help things. You guys have mentioned transactions as well, payments being important. Grace, your recent article noting that last year, one in five crypto owners said transactions were their primary objective for owning cryptos, as according to McKinsey. Also notes the transaction value will hit over $16 billion next year, but that's just less than, still less than one in every $10,000, one in every $10,000 in payments made across the globe, but it is growing. Uh, We have crypto owner numbers, as I mentioned, 33, 34 million this year. We also have cryptocurrency payment users as well. So of those crypto owners this year, 11% of them will be crypto payment users. Next year, 15% of those crypto owners will be crypto payment users. David, which user use case, uh, because you lay out, Grace, you lay out four in the report, but which user use case is most likely to drive adoption? Well, what we're looking at here from a forecast perspective, when we talk about crypto payers, is we are talking about consumers using these digital wallets, non-card payments, or consumers using card payments uh, that are crypto enabled. And so we see both of those helping to drive crypto payer adoption going forward. But I think the real driver isn't the card payments. Those are still really, really small. It's the non-card payments. It's the digital wallets that are driving the most growth. And I think that will continue to drive them through most growth. Mm -hmm. You think about digital wallets, they can, you know, leapfrog the need for infrastructure. You don't need a card network necessarily to be able to use a digital wallet. There's fraud prevention bona fides that show through here. And you've got some real fascinating incumbent activity here. I, I mean, PayPal is, I think, a, a real leader here in the in the payment space for crypto. And you have something that it's enabled called Checkout with Crypto. Okay. This enables the, the PayPal wallet user to choose crypto as a funding source at checkout with virtually any merchant that accepts PayPal. So think about that. Millions and millions and millions of merchants that are immediately connected to a crypto payer. The key is being able to enable that payment opportunity. And that's exactly what PayPal has done at scale. Yeah. Finally, folks, what was the most interesting finding from this US crypto payments report? David, I'll start with you. I'd go with uh, with PayPal. I think it's revolutionary to be able to connect its digital wallet, which is already almost, uh, you know, the adoption is through the roof to all of the millions of merchants uh, and enabling the, the crypto owners that PayPal is also courting. Yeah. Grace, how about you? In wake of the recent turmoil, I think the most important thing for my report is that while there's a ton of volatility, the long-term outlook is still positive. We still expect to see growth, mainly because there's so much incumbent buy-in. Visa and MasterCard have really made deep investments in the space. PayPal, as David said, MoneyGram, just so many big payment names have really invested in the space and continue to grow in the space. 
Mm -hmm. I think, is this where I can plug Grace as being brilliant? Just a fantastic analyst. Yeah, this is the spot. Yeah, it's right now. All right. Well, there it is. Yep. (laughs) Uh, That's all we've got time for. For the lead, it's time now for the halftime report. So, Grace, I'll start with you. We talked about a lot for the first half, but one takeaway for the listeners. The main takeaway is that despite the craziness of the crypto markets in the past couple of weeks, long-term growth is still positive and we still expect crypto payments to take off in the future. David, how about you? PayPal connecting its digital wallet users to merchants to pay with crypto. All right, it's time now for In Other News, but first a quick word from our sponsor, MParticle. At the end of the day, your customer has to be at the center of everything you do. This starts with the right customer data strategy as well as the right foundation to solve the challenges that typically inhibit success, such as data quality, data governance, and connectivity. MParticle is your real-time customer data infrastructure that helps you accelerate your data strategy by cleansing, visualizing, and integrating your customer data from anywhere to anywhere. Ultimately, better data leads to better decisions, better customer experiences, and better outcomes. See why the best brands choose MParticle. Go to www. Folks, we are back today in other news. The fintech bubble has burst and what neobanks can do about profitability. So we, uh, before we start the stories, we just put together a new report titled The Error of Uncertainty, where our analysts tackle client questions on crashing tech, broken supply chains, the war, and inflation. The two financial-related sections of that report that we want to talk about today are uh, story one, the fintech bubble has burst. The report notes that global fintech funding beat records last year, but funding has since dried up. Many fintechs that IPO'd in 2021 have seen their valuations halved or worse. Neobanks by now pay later companies and crypto firms have all suffered. But David, the one most significant short-term change and also the one most significant long-term change we can expect to see as a result of all this are blank and blank. Short-term buy now pay later, long-term CBDCs in the spotlight. Okay, talk to me why. Well, buy now pay later has been a growth darling, uh, but it's also... For that reason, these companies have become, their valuations have declined uh, precipitously over the last several months. I think they're going to have to grapple with that in addition to already grappling with regulation that's around the bend. Uh, You've got interest rates rising that I think can affect the funding costs of these buy now, pay laters, uh, investor financing becoming more expensive. If there's a recession, you know, and I'm not going to say there is or there isn't going to be one, but if there is, you've got consumer spending slumps and rising consumer delinquencies that buy now, pay later providers are going to have to contend with. That's a hard, hard, hard go. And for the long term trend? Uh, CBDCs, I think, are going to be the ultimate benefactors of some of the crypto fallout here. They uh, have the potential to be heavily regulated and uh, can provide an alternative to stablecoins. If the stablecoin house isn't going to be put in order, it's CUDC's gain. Story two, neobanks and profitability. This year, 25 million Americans will be neobank account holders. That's 10% of US adults. According to us, growing 23%, a neobank being a digitally native, digital-only bank like Chime, for example. The report notes that prominent neobanks in the US, Latin America, the UK, and continental Europe experienced massive funding rounds in 2021 as neobanks dangled expensive carrots, such as fee-free overdrafts up to $100 to draw in customers by the millions, but investors will now prize profits over new customers. Grace, the way neobanks will turn on the profitability taps will be blank. Cutting incentives. So neobanks will need to cut back on incentives for new customers and push down customer servicing costs and aggressively cross-sell to balance the books. So we should also watch for customer acquisition rates and losses to follow valuations down to earth as these neobanks really start to focus on profits over new customers. And that is what we have time for. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Grace. 
Thanks, Marcus. It was great to talk to you. Thank you to David. Thank you, Marcus. Great to see you. Yes, indeed, folks. And thank you to Victoria. She edits the show. Thanks to everyone listening in. We'll see you tomorrow for the Behind the Numbers Reimagining Retail, an e-marketer podcast made possible by M. Pascal, where your host, Sarah Lebo, will be talking with Susie David Canyon all about private label brands. Oh,